All right, so I think we're off and live here. Um, I don't see anything in my screen, but I trust that we're live. Um, I'm here with uh, Andy Slavitt, uh, I think one of the most well-informed and thoughtful commentators and, and researchers into our healthcare system that I know. Um, are you there, Andy? I'm here. Good. Well, thank you so much for making time. I know how busy you are. Um, this is the, obviously, and you know this, the 10th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. We just thought it'd be great to grab 10 or 15 minutes of your time and, you know, kind of go back and, and recognize that this provided affordable uh, health insurance for millions of Americans, high quality affordable health care. What do you think is the, the legacy 10 years later? Well, you know, it's funny. I think I imagine on a day like today, what would happen if the ACA had been repealed and we had 22 million more people without insurance and everybody who got COVID-19, which is going to be a lot of people, uh, no longer being able to qualify for coverage. Um, and uh, I think about uh, uh, how grateful I am for everybody, uh, especially you, Governor, uh, because I'm not sure everybody's quite aware of the role you played um, hand in hand with governors across the country, Republicans and Democrats, in uh, arguing for what's sensible to people. Um, and that was, uh, that was so essential, or we might not have been in the spot uh, where we were. Uh, but I, I think the legacy of the ACA is interesting because it's got three pieces to it. One that's kind of a conservative Republican idea, and two rather more liberal ideas. Um, the, the most conservative idea is this idea of insurance exchanges which allow people with moderate incomes to get insurance for the first time. And that was successful for people. Um, it was also very successful for insurance companies. And I think some people object to that. It was a kind of a big boon for insurance companies and the coverage that people have and the choices they have isn't, isn't quite as great. Uh, the second idea was a more liberal idea, which is called Medicaid expansion, which turned out to probably be the most popular and most successful part of the ACA for the states that expanded Medicaid. Uh, and in those states, I'm, I'm being told I need to adjust this. <laughs> You're okay. My wife is you, not you like the great. angle that I'm being seen at. Nope. <laughs> nope. All right. How's this? Better? Look down. She wants me to look down. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, I, just, I can do less about that than I can about the ACA at this point. <laughs> Me Medicaid expansion is uh, you know, really what I think has changed a tremendous amount of health outcomes across the country. For the states that chose to expand, they've seen superior health outcomes and financial outcomes, and, uh, and that's great. And then the third idea, which is also rather kind of a more of a, of a liberal idea, is the idea of these consumer protections, this package of protections, protecting people with pre-existing conditions, protecting people uh, from lifetime limits, basically taking a bunch of decisions that used to be the, the province of insurance companies to make, and saying that's no longer the insurance company's decision uh, that's going to be guaranteed across the country so that you don't have to worry if you get sick or if you lose your job that you'll be able to get insurance and i think that's a very popular set of provisions so as right. we sit here 10 years out i'd say no law is perfect if the congress would have spent 10 years um, fixing and improving the things that weren't working instead of arguing over it it would be far better today I think that's quite frankly why we need people like you in the U.S. Senate. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I think that that leads to the next question. Uh, uh, one of our supporters and viewers, uh, Kenneth, had had sent in a, a question, you know, just describing, and, and he's absolutely right, that the Republicans tried to get rid of the Affordable Care Act legislatively, then they tried to do it administratively, uh, and now they're trying to do it through the courts. And, you know, the Republicans in Washington have, have, have pursued this case is now in, in front of the Supreme Court. And Kenneth's question was, what effect would that have on the, the protections for people with pre-existing medical conditions if, that, if, if, they, if, if Republicans are successful in that lawsuit against the ACA? Well, the federal protections will go away. You know, the, as, as this very astute question uh, indicated, there's already been some chipping away of it at, at, through administrative action. Um, I've, I've asked people in the Trump White House, because I've been quite puzzled since they don't have a replacement plan. Uh, it would be one thing if they said, look, we have a plan and it's better as measured by the fact that it covers more things and it's cheaper and people will like it more and it's uh, all, all of those things. They, they haven't. 
I mean, they've had they've had a lot of time to do it. They've had you know a decade to do it. And they 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 haven't. So I'm puzzled since they don't. Why he would say yesterday evening in the middle of a global pandemic that he wants to get rid of the ACA still. And I I so I, I've asked people in the White House who I know and who work for him. Does he really want to get rid of the ACA, or is there some game? Is there some other part of this agenda that I don't understand? And their answer was yes, he wants to get rid of it. Well, it's, it's again, given the how impulsive he is, and I gather his comments uh, this afternoon, uh, you know, trying to set a time limit on how long we try to flatten the the bulge. Hard to imagine, right? Yeah, I mean, look. First of all. Um, you know, you as a governor completely understand the concept of constraining options, where if you do one thing, right, it's better for the economy, and if you do another thing, it's better for health. And, you know, if he were to level with the American public and say, this is a really difficult challenge, and we need to make this together, and there's no perfect answer, um, I think he'd get a lot of support for that. I mean, at least during this crisis, uh, because... Um, even his critics would say, yeah, that, I will salute that. But what's happening instead is, um, as, as I think we fear, is whoever has the loudest voice around him. Right. If it's Larry Kudlow um, who has that last conversation, or if it's, um, you know, someone, Dr. Burke, if it's Dr. Burke. And um, what is happening is that he is, seems to be drawing closer and closer to saying there's just going to be an arbitrary finish because he's right. impatient and he wants to... I think demonstrate that he's got command over when this begins and ends. Sadly, he has no more command over this virus than he does the stock market. The virus, and and look, you're a man of science in addition to being a man of government. So uh, um, you understand that Trump is really having it. Well, doesn't quite understand this notion of exponential growth. What he understands, right. he might understand the notion of loan sharking, um, and so maybe we'll put it in loan sharking terms. But waiting a, a month to fight the virus, or more than a month, which is what he's done, is in effect saying, I'm going to borrow money from a loan shark at $1,000, and then I'm going to wait a month to pay him back at 25% interest. You'll never get ahead. You wake up and you realize you own you owe $50,000. And so when you get to the give him the $5,000 check, you owe $80,000. And so um, there's only one thing that, scientists and uh, experts are telling us around the world that we can do right now, and that is hashtags stay home for a, for a period of time which allows our medical professionals to catch up, allows some of our science to catch up, allows our testing capabilities to set up, to catch up. And if the president went on TV and said, you know what, small businesses, you can open, you can open just as soon as you have temperature testing, uh, right outside, right, you know, thermometers right outside of your business establishment. And as soon as you can make sure that you've got the capacity issues down and we'll slowly but surely move the economy back into a normal pace. It won't happen bang all at once like he wants it to, but it'll happen in a more reasonable way. All right. Well, I think that's the only real solution is to kind of, you know, make sure that you have some objective measures by which people know they're not going to make this problem worse. The worst for any small business person, having been there, your worst nightmare is that you step in, you think you're doing the right thing, and you make something that's already very bad, you make it worse. Right, right. So, I, I, I've had, and I know you have as well, small business owners call and tell me, I make all of my income. I, my, uh, one of the coaches of my son's former basketball team called and said, I make all of my income over the summer because I run this basketball league team and um, uh, what should I do? I want to do the right thing. They said, we don't have a lot of savings, but I'm going to do the right thing. And I think people all over the country, if asked, um, are going to put some sacrifice forward in order to have a better future. And let's face it, you know, 18 months when you're on the front side of it, if that's how long we're talking about, sounds like an incredibly intolerable amount of time. 18 months in the rearview window, uh, you remember 18 months in your, in, one of your, in your kid's life, right? I'm to anybody out there, and they fly by. And so we have, uh, we have a new normal. 
um, we can make that new normal as um, positive or negative as we can try, but we also could try to save as many lives as possible. And right. I think that's that's really what this is about. Absolutely. Well, listen, I know you're short on time. You've been on MSNBC. You've got other uh, news media to go to. I want to thank you so much and thank everyone who's viewing. Uh, I did want to ask you one last question because it is so important to get people back to washing their hands the full 20 seconds, right? And to kind of to scratch around a little bit under the under the fingernails. But uh, what the, the, the thing that I was taught was what, uh, what song, it, usually you could take one verse and maybe some songs you, you need two verses or two choruses, but what yeah. song would, do you sing to yourself when you're washing your hands to make sure you get 20 seconds? So do you, uh, do you like the police? Yeah, of course. How about don't stand so close to me? <laughs> That's good. I was, I've been using for the last few days, uh, this land is your land, but I think don't, don't stand to me actually is a little more, it's got a little more punch. You got to shake it up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Andy, thank you so much. Hang in there. I know you've been working long hours and long days, and uh, we really thank you for your service. You too. Thanks for everything, Governor. You bet. Thank you.